From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Barney Wilson, DA's office. Oh, morning, Mr. Wilson. Say, you're on an expense account, aren't you? That's right. Good, I'm not. How about buying me a lunch? You got a deal. 12 o'clock here at my hotel? Sold. Found any more shoes? No, and no bodies. Not yet, anyway. I'm amazed. Did find one thing you may be interested in, though. What's that? We got a lead on that license number you gave me last night. You were right. The car was bought from a dealer about two weeks ago. By who? Somebody named John Smith, over on the east side of town. That figures. Well, maybe here's something that won't. I checked the address this morning. And you know what? Sure, a vacant lot. Well, now, how the devil did you know? See you at lunch, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Miami Beach, Florida. To the home office, Delta Liability, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Fathom Five matter. A sunken cruiser that refused to give up its debt. (laughs) Item 10, $4.80, lunch with DA Deputy Barney Wilson. A man who'd made up his mind about the case before I'd even arrived in town. Murder, he'd called it. When the hired cruiser, Fathom Five, burned and sank mysteriously a mile or two offshore. But nobody'd been found yet. And I still doubt it very much that one ever would be. Because I wasn't even certain that William Markey was dead. Wilson, of course, had different ideas. Yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. It's an old, old story. Two men go out in a boat and only one comes back. No witnesses, nothing. And if that doesn't indicate murder, I... Say, pass the sugar, will you, please? Sure, here. You're convinced it's murder and you're convinced young Danny Haynes did it. Well, who else? Well, now that would be a fine argument to advance in court, wouldn't it? Sure, sure. Certain conviction. Simply because you can't produce any other suspect. Wilson, I don't think there's been any murder at all. Now you can pass me the sugar. All right. Suppose you let me tell you how I figure it. While I'm eating my dessert? Marky and his wife took a liking to this Haynes kid and practically made him one of the family. And right there was their mistake. It usually is. Because Haynes started getting ideas about his boss's wife. You have to admit, Mrs. Marker is a mighty pretty woman. Who could deny it? She's Haynes' own age, and her husband was older. So the kid in that bird brain of his figured he had it all tagged. Figured she actually went for him. I think he probably started bothering her, making a nuisance out of himself. And I'll lay you odds she'll admit he did, once she's convinced he's guilty. Well, I got a sneaking hunch you may be right on that. Oh, thank you, thank you. So what happened? Marky finally noticed the kid was getting a little out of line. Probably didn't even take it seriously at first, but eventually he must have decided he'd better get Haynes straightened out. So he took him out on that fishing boat in order to talk to him alone, is that it? Mm-hmm. No, you're with a dollar. But the thing backfired. Haynes probably got mad, maybe started a fight, knocked Marky out, and that gave him his big idea. Spur of the moment, huh? Yes, sir. Now, with the boss out of the way, he'd have a clear field with the widow. So he threw Marky overboard, set fire to the cruiser, opened the seacock so it would be sure and sink, and then rowed away in the dinghy. And how could he be sure the body wouldn't be found, washed ashore by the currents? Oh, he couldn't be sure. But what if it was? There was a heavy fog. Nobody saw what happened. He knew it would be mighty tough to prove anything on him. Oh, brother, that's an understatement. As a matter of fact, it'll be impossible to prove that story. Yeah, well, once he's arrested and interrogated... I figure he'll break down and tell us the whole thing. Not unless he's completely simple-minded. No, you haven't even got the shadow of a case, Mr. Wilson. All you've got is a wild theory that doesn't even fit the facts. You got a better theory, I suppose. I think so. And would it be the kind that would take your company off the hook on that $75,000 life insurance policy? Well, by coincidence, it just so happens that it would. In fact, that insurance policy is the key to the whole thing. Uh Uh-huh. I sort of thought you might say that. I didn't have any pet theory at first, but I do now. I'm pretty sure this thing is an out-and-out insurance fraud, and Danny Haynes is being used as the fall guy. Oh, do tell. 
And what are you finding for evidence, Mr. Dowling? Oh, a lot of little things that are sort of starting to add up. For one thing, I got a long telegram this morning from a firm of confidential investigators in New York. I forwarded a request through Hartford yesterday. Yeah, they turned up quite a lot on Markey. Such as? His financial status for the main thing. Oh, well, go on. Well, when he and Mrs. Markey were married three years ago, the firm was in first-class shape. But they've been living high, living up his capital. If he got that contract he came down here after, it, well, it might have pulled him through. But he didn't get it. And that result, he was flat broke. So what? A lot of people are broke. But not many of them have a $75,000 policy. Uh, I thought that's what you were getting at. What I am getting at is what I think happened. And I think Danny Haynes is telling the truth. I think Marky did send him off alone in that dinghy. Then Marky fired the boat, opened the seacocks, and while she filled up and sank, he swam ashore in the fog. And he's waiting it out somewhere now until his widow collects the insurance. Well, I don't see where you've got any more evidence than I have. Well, there's not much, I'll grant you. Not so far. But what there is adds up. I guess I'm just stupid, darling. All right, look. Take Mrs. Markey's attitude, for instance. She's trying hard to play the role, but it doesn't come off. Now, does she act to you like a four-day widow? Well, she's got a lot of self-control. Oh, I'll say she has. I tried to goad her yesterday when I talked to her, came right out and practically insulted her. And how did she react? Never took her eyes off that main chance, the 75000 Well, you know, it's not exactly unheard of for a widow not to mind too much being a widow. Oh, no, no, that's not the impression she gives. She's tense enough, nervous as a cat. But it's not because of grief or any feeling of relief, either. It's because she's afraid she might say the wrong thing and let her foot slip. Well... Everybody's got a right to their own opinion. Another thing is that Marky's body hasn't turned up. Now, I talked to the harbor master this morning. He knows the currents along this coast backwards and forwards. He says it's the only one chance in a hundred that Marky's body would have been carried out through the reef instead of thrown up on the beach about where you found that shoe. So this is the one time in a hundred. <sighs> that was a mighty fine lunch, Mr. Dollar. We're going to fight you, Mr. Wilson, if you petition the court to declare Marky legally dead. Yes, I sort of figured you would. Hensley and Davis phoned me this morning and said you'd retain them as counsel. That's right. Well, I've been fought before. Expense account item 11, 10 cents. Phone call to Edna Markey, widow of the allegedly deceased and beneficiary of his insurance policy. Hello? Mrs. Markey? Yes? This is Johnny Dollar. Oh. Oh, I didn't recognize your voice. I wonder if I could ask a favor of you. Well, if it's something I can... I'd like to borrow a photograph of your late husband for a few hours. Well... I'll take good care of it and make sure it gets back to you. Well, the fact is I really don't have one. Oh, well, uh, you must have forgotten. I, I noticed one yesterday afternoon on the mantel in your study. Well, I, I meant not a good one. Well, that one will do fine, and thanks a lot. Uh, has uh, something new come up, Mr. Dollar? Yes, yeah, she might say that. I'll send a messenger out to pick it up. Goodbye, Mrs. Markey. <laughs> Item 12, $3.80, messenger service. Item 13, $1.90, taxi fare to the used car lot of one truthful Tom, the dealer who'd sold a car to a man named John Smith, a car that had departed suddenly from the vicinity of the Markey Beach House when its driver saw me come out of the house. I wasn't too sure whether Tom was truthful or not, but one thing was certain, he was typical. I notice you looking at that little gray job, friend, and I say to myself, truthful Tom, don't you go trying to get the best of that lad, because he's walked right in here and spotted the best dog gone by on the lot before he's even turned around. Well, I, I wasn't really thinking of buying it. Friend, with the price I'll make you on that car, you can't afford not to buy it. No, no, I'm not really in the market. It's an economic society, friend. We're all in the market when the price is right. No, I just happened to notice that it looked like the car a friend of mine had stolen a few weeks ago. My dear friend, I'll make you... Um... Uh, did you say stolen? Oh, it may not be the same one, of course. I've got papers on that car. I've got papers on every last car on this lot. Did you have papers on the one you sold to John Smith two weeks ago? If he says I didn't, he's a liar. Now, wait a minute, mister. And I can get a dozen witnesses to prove it. You remember him, then? Well, do you? Remember who? Look, I'm a special investigator for the Delta liability. It's a frame-up, that's all it is. Whoever it is says they got a hot car deal on this lot is lying. Truthful Tom never turned a dishonest penny in his whole doggone life. Good, then we'll forget it. And any low-down rat that says I did is a two-legged snake, and I... What'd you say? I don't care anything about your deals. I'm trying to locate a fellow who bought a car from you. Well, friend, uh, that puts a different light on it. Uh, John Smith, you said? That's the name he used. 
I can't say I recollect anybody by that name. Here's a copy of the title registry on the car. Let's see now. 6842 Dark Green... Oh, that was that old clunker that... Uh, of course, it was well worth the price I was asking. You remember the buyer? You bet your life. You know why? Because he paid cash. Not a check, cash. I mean, the real long green Missoula. Would you recognize a photograph of him? Well, I might if... Oh, was this it? Well, let's see now. Well? Uh, no doubt of it, friend. That's the lad, all right. Good evening, Mrs. Markey. Mr. Dollar. I brought back the photograph of your husband. Oh, there wasn't that much hurry about it. Did it help any? Quite a bit. Do you mind if I come in? Well, all right, of course. Thank you. You know, I've been trying to think all day long what you could possibly want with that picture. I still can't imagine. You can't, huh? Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. It's a terrible picture, of course. That's why I hesitated about giving it to you. It doesn't look a thing like him. It looked enough like him, Mrs. Markey. Enough like him? I don't think I know what you mean. Did you know your husband bought a second-hand car the week before his so-called death? You must be mistaken. He'd have told me about it. The car dealer positively identifies his photograph. He used the name John Smith, paid for it in cash. What did you mean, so-called death? William Markey isn't dead. I think we're both aware of that. Well, Mrs. Markey, aren't we? Do you mind telling me what you're talking about? It wasn't even a very smart scheme to start with. Your husband must have been really up against the wall, or he'd have known better than to try it. But I suppose he thought he had to in order to hang on to you. I imagine you're pretty expensive to support. I think you'd better leave right now. Actually, it would serve you both right if I did. But I decided to give you a chance. I came here to let you know exactly where you stand. And where is that, if I may ask? One step away from prison. Take that step, and you're in up to your necks, you and your husband both. What step? So far, we have no case against you for attempted fraud, because you haven't filed a claim yet. But take my advice, Mrs. Markey, don't file one, because the minute you do, we're going to hit you with both barrels. You've got some pretty crazy ideas, haven't you? You've had fair warning. I've had one of the biggest bluffs I've ever heard about. Why, you people would do anything, wouldn't you, to keep from paying off on a policy? Better talk it over with your husband before you do anything foolish. My husband is dead, Mr. Dollar. No one but you even doubts it. I'm a cynic. How much proof does it take to bring you to your senses? Mrs. Markey, as this case stands right now, there's only one way you could convince me that William Markey is not alive. Show me his dead body. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a crazy kid in love, a right decision by a court, and then the whole case smashes wide open. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield... It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>